Good, good to see you all. So my name is Mike, I'm the lead pastor here, and if you are with us for the first time, we're really glad you're here. Hope that you come back and see if City Life is the place that God wants you to be. We think it is, we just need you to figure that out too. So uh, we just want to welcome you, but today we are in the middle of a series called Made for More, and one of the frustrating things about Christians that it seems they live their life by is not ever knowing what God called them to do, and so we're going to kind of look at that today and address that, but we need to do a little bit of work before we jump in there. One of the things that I am horrible at is appreciating our volunteers. Our volunteers literally make this place run, and so we just want to work through them. So if I call your, your area that you serve in out, go ahead and stand up so we can thank you. Um, city kids back there that are literally going right now, teaching your children, keeping them safe, and letting them have a lot of fun learning about Jesus, we want to thank for them. So go ahead and stand up if you work city kids. Um, go ahead and stay standing. Our, our worship, so everybody who was just up on the stage and the ones who are on teams not playing today, go ahead and stand up. <laughs> and I do want to direct your attention back to the sound booth because these guys love everyone to look at them. So um, Jimmy in the middle has done an incredible job holding that, bo- that sound booth down. He knew nothing about sound when he went back there. Jimmy's the one in the middle that wants you to look right at him right now. And so he has learned. He's done an incredible job. Um, I specifically want to thank Jimmy for holding that down by himself for a really long time. Uh, And then God blessed us with Mike right next to him who has 25 years experience doing this. So he brought his expertise back there to that booth. And so now we have a rock star crew back there. So we can thank them again. Good. Um, Hey, volunteers, stay standing, man. Come on. You got to stay up let everybody see you. Um, security team, anybody in here? They're probably out protecting us right now, so you can't see them. Um, communion, the people that set up our communion every single week. Go ahead and stand up. Our front door, our greeters who greet you as you come in. Our city group leaders who lead our ministries outside of this uh, building and homes throughout the week. Stand up if that's you. Our middle school and high school leaders and volunteers. Go ahead and stand up, all of you. Yeah. And... One of the most important jobs in this building is our cleaning crew. They, keep, they clean this building every single week, tirelessly, without end, and they never even know. You never even know who they are. Um, and so if they are in here and want to stand up, that's fine. If not, you don't have to. You can rename, remain anonymous. But we want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We literally cannot do this without you. And we're going to say thank you with Long's Donuts for you next Sunday. So make sure you're here. All right? Love you guys. Hey, go ahead and remain standing the whole service. I have to do it. You guys can too. (laughs) All right. So um, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to pray for these pastors in these churches in our city that are working towards unity. So God has allowed me to be uh, the point person for an organization called Christ Together that uses their tools and resources as they come into a city and they find churches um, or they, they find a person and try to get them to get churches to work together. And so the goal we're working towards is becoming the church in Greenwood, not a bunch of different churches in Greenwood. And then that hopefully that's going to spread to Indianapolis and then the state and so on and so on. And this is happening at a large, large scale in two different cities in the U.S. And one of them is Buffalo, New York, and the other is Austin, Texas. And they're starting in some other cities. And Indianapolis is one that they have pegged as one of the cities that can do this. And, and so God has has been gracious to us. I've been able to get these pastors around the table and talk through what unity would look like. And so we're going to pray for them every single week. And as churches come on board, we're going to pray for them as well. And so um, as we, as right before we go to uh, the Lord in prayer, we're going to pray for these churches as well. And I encourage you to take a look at these names. When you see these shirts out in a grocery store, these signs in the yard, stop and talk to them. They're your fellow followers of Jesus. They're not the enemy. Okay. Uh, we want to work together for this unity in the city. All right. Uh, But one more thing we need to celebrate. Uh, A lady named Brandy, last week, uh, we went and sat down on the couches and we were having a conversation. And so pre-COVID, she um, were were on the very couches when our room was different. They were over here. Um, She was in a horrible, horrible spot in her life. And so she was trying to get clean from some addictions and um, was not having much success at that, would have some and then fall back in. And so uh, before COVID hit, um, 
she knew Jesus was the answer, but didn't want to respond out of pressure to get her life right or like, hey, my, my life is in the bottom. I need Jesus now. And so um, through quarantine, she actually had a person from City Life, a lady from City Life, come alongside and walk alongside of her and show her the gospel on a daily basis. And so last week, I got the privilege of sitting with Brandy and April, who walked with her over here on those couches, and she accepted Jesus. Is that amazing? And so we know that Jesus is still at work every week, and he's drawing people to himself regardless of what is happening in our world. And so let's just go to the Lord and pray and, and lift him up and ask him to do something here today. God, we love you, and I just want to thank you so much for everything that you're doing here at City Life, that we get to be a part of this. And um, God, thank you so much for rescuing Brandy and the weight that you lifted off of her. I know that it was incredible to experience freedom for the first time. God, we pray right now for all the churches that are preaching this gospel-centered message in this city. And Danny from Emmanuel and Matt from Greenwood Christian and Brock from Redeemer and Ken from New Heights and, and Andrew from um, Antioch. <laughs> Lord, you knew who it was. Um, but anyways, uh, God, we just pray for these men. We pray for their churches, and we pray, God, that they would be promoting the same unity in their churches all around this city. Because, God, the one thing that the enemy does not want us to do is to work together, but you've actually called us to work together. It was actually your prayer in John 17 that we as followers of Jesus would unite together, that we would come around this cause. And so, God, we pray that you're just as you've been laying the foundation for this and that you have been bringing these pastors around this table long before we ever knew it, God, that we're just really excited to see what you're going to do with this. And so we thank you so much for the cities that are, have put this in place already and are being examples to us. And God, I pray that we would be able to just follow you and, and let our hearts be humbled and to work behind whatever you're doing. So today we pray that we would realize what we're made for because today it's literally that we are made for more. I pray, God, that we would step into this in Ephesians 4, what you're calling us to do. And I pray that we would leave here differently than we came in. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Ephesians 4. We're just going to read a few verses there to start out. Um, but I, before we do that, I want to ask you a question. Um, don't raise your hand, but how many of you know exactly what you're supposed to do with your life? And if the answer to that is yes, are you doing it? Okay. If the answer is no, let me ask you, why aren't you? Number one. Uh, and why don't you know what you're supposed to do? But it's the number one frustration that seems to plague not just Christians, but people in general. So this process is so weird to me because it starts out almost in middle school where people start to ask you what you want to do with your life. And, and I'm sorry, in elementary school even. In elementary school, they have no idea. They want to be superheroes and stuff like that, okay? Middle school, you just want to be something professional that you get paid lots of money for, right? You still have no idea. High school, you start to maybe pay attention to mom and dad's jobs and see that they make some money or see they don't make money. And you're like, okay, I'm not going to do that, right? I am going to do that. And you start to like maybe pay attention a little bit more of what life might look like if you did this for a living. And then you get out of school. And the reason why the number one degree program in America is a general studies program is because nobody knows what they want to do with their life, right? And so they have all these graduations of general studies degrees because companies are requiring degrees now, but nobody knows what they want to do with their life. And this translates into Christianity because when you hear me stand up here and talk about and tell you that Jesus has made you to do more, you don't even know what that is practically in your life, let alone spiritually in your life. And so this is what we want to work through. And this is why we've been teaching this series of you being made for more. So if you've missed any of this, we encourage you to go back and listen online uh, or catch it on YouTube. And so now we're answering the question or making the statement that you are made for more. So we've worked up to this point. I want you to understand and process, this is much, much bigger than just you, okay? I want you to think about the ripple effect this has when you don't live into what God has called you to do. Therefore, you're not affecting what you should be affecting. And then if somebody else is not living in what they should be doing, and they're having a ripple effect, and they're not affecting change where they should be. And then this person is not living into it. And then this ripple effect calls because they're not living in. And that we're just talking about three people, and imagine how big this reach goes. Now, ponder this question. Do you think the church is to blame for the distraction and the division in our country? Just sit with that question for a second. Do you think the church is to blame? Now, when I say the church, I mean the people, because Jesus says the people is, are the church. 
Do you think the church is to blame for the distraction and the division in this country? Not solely, but I think it has a huge part in it. Because I want you to think about how differently this world would look if we were living into what we were called to live into. And and Ephesians 4 is going to answer that question for us. So I want you to ponder that question as we're moving. Now, look at Ephesians 4. We're going to look at three verses. These three verses are packed with so much we could literally spend a month here, but we're going to do this quickly today. So this is Paul talking right into this church in Ephesus, and he says, Therefore, I... The prisoner in the Lord urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Okay, there is a lot in those verses. Let's go back to verse one. He says, therefore, I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you've received. He does not say, for those of you who have received a calling, he says, I urge all of you, because all of you have a calling from Jesus. As you surrendered your life to him, what I want you to understand is he called you to do two things. He called you to be a hope dealer, which is why we display this shirt at City Life, because we genuinely believe that. But he also called you to a certain thing in life. Now, let me just say this, okay? I don't want you to think like God gave me this certain career path to live in this certain house and drive this certain car. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, as a parent, sometimes my kids have asked me what I thought they should do, and they've displayed a few options for me. And honestly, none of them were wrong. So I say, pick whichever one you want. It doesn't matter. Like if you you pick this one, it's not going to be wrong. If you pick this one, it's not going to be wrong. You pick this one, it's not going to be wrong. Now, sometimes they have presented choices where I'm like, no, that's definitely wrong. Don't do that. Okay. But sometimes, I mean, God deals with us the same way. You have to remember, he answers this in one of three ways. Yes, no, or not right now. There's no maybes. You can't sway him. It's yes, no, and not right now. Okay. So I want you to think about the process of your life and what he has called you to do There may be multiple things in front of you that he would say, no, if you step into these, they're not wrong. Just step into them. But then here's the hard part. A lot of times we start to create a life for ourselves based on the money we're making because we now realize we can buy stuff. We now realize like, oh, I can have an apartment, then a house, and then this vehicle, and then this. And so, all right, I don't really like what I'm doing, but I can pay my bills, so I'm going to keep doing this. And so we create this career based around something that honestly we had no desire to do in the first place but we're making money doing it and it'd be really hard to give up the stuff that we have right now so i'm going to ask you to start to think through that process if jesus were sitting with you here today and you guys were whiteboarding your life and he says okay so you were born here in this part of the city And you're alive right now in 2020 to go through this. And I I put you here for a reason. I rescued you in this year, this day, this time. And this is what I had for your life. Now I want you to just imagine you laying whatever you're doing on top of that whiteboard of Jesus and see if it matches. And a lot of you are like, I have no idea if it matches. I know. And that's the problem here is because a lot of times we just buy into whatever dream somebody else is selling us and we go, okay, I'm, that's what I'm going to do. And we don't sit and we don't stop and we go, okay, wait a minute, what am I actually made to do with my life? Now, some of you have done this and that's great. I encourage you to look around and help other people figure this out too because not too many people actually have this figured out. But all of this starts right here. I urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received. So the course of my life, I started out in construction and I was a general contractor by trade doing the church with my construction company at the same time or running other people's, whatever that looked like. Here's what this verse is saying. My very first day on the job, I carried wood from the piles up to the people building the houses. So I'm traipsing through the mud, I'm in all the nasty weather, and I'm just getting the supplies to them so they can build the house, okay? 
Then I'm like, man, I don't want to do this forever. I'm going to move up there. And so I became that guy up there. Now people are bringing me the wood. I'm building this. Well, then I had a job site foreman, a superintendent that was telling me how to build the house. And I'm like, I feel like, like I, could, I could look at a set of blueprints. I could stand back and I could tell people how to build a house. So I want to do that. So I did that. But then there's this guy that pulled up in the truck for about three seconds and said, how's everything going? Good? Okay. And he drove off. I'm like, dang, I really want that job. Okay. <laughs> And so then I got that job, and I owned my own company, and I did that, and I stayed for five seconds because I was a really good boss. And <laughs> but I was unsatisfied because it's not what I was supposed to be doing. But as I was thinking about this verse, if I, as the boss, pulled up in my truck to get out to see how everybody was doing, and I went over and I started carrying wood for the day, it would confuse a lot of people because that's not what God has called me to do. I'm not living in the manner worthy of what I was called to do. I'm the owner of the company. I'm supposed to step into that position and I'm supposed to live that well, take care of these people well, do my job well, make sure they have jobs to go to. But if I am distracted by carrying wood on the job site because I just want to make sure my people have this, I'm not stepping into what I'm supposed to be doing. And a lot of us, as we surrender our life to Jesus, we step into this calling, we are surrendered and saved by grace, and then we go back and we start doing the things that we used to do, and it's confusing to everybody, including you. Because you've not ever lived worthy of the calling that you have received. See, this is something that has blown my mind. I've grown up in church predominantly my whole life, except for like a four or five year span of time. When I came back to the church, I truly got saved and I saw things completely differently. But the one thing that was consistent all across all the churches I ever have been to that I remember vividly is everyone takes being a hope dealer as an option. Everybody takes, go tell people about this hope you have found as an option. This is the first thing you're called to do. This is what I need you to know. He says, I urge you, I'm begging you. This is what this means. I'm passionately begging you to live into the calling of being a hope dealer. Whatever else you do with the rest of your life, what God has called you, that's secondary to this. But it seems like people have a laundry list of excuses this long of why we don't share our faith, of why we don't take the hope of the gospel to people, and we treat it as an option. It's not an option. So the first thing that I need you to understand is you're made for more. It starts with you not only realizing the hope that you've been rescued with, but it's not optional for you to share that with other people. And so that's the very first thing that you're supposed to step into and live into this calling. Now, the rest of it, God is going to give you some leeway. He's going to bring people around you. The Bible says to, to look for safety in a multitude of counselors, which the leadership of the church can help you with. All of that stuff is secondary to that first and foremost primary calling of you being a hope dealer. I need you to know that first, okay? But then look at Ephesians 4.2. This is how this is going to be accomplished. With all humility. The enemy of progress with Jesus is pride. The successful entry point to intimacy with Jesus is humility. The thing that I can tell you is this piece right here, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, those are pretty much the opposite descriptions of everything that you read, see, and hear today about our world, right? You, as a follower of Jesus, are called to be all these things. Now, with humility, this literally means to have a humble opinion of yourself, okay? So to have a humble opinion of myself does not mean I think I'm a worthless piece of garbage, because that is not what Jesus said about me, nor did he say that about you. What he said about you is, you are a daughter of the king, you're a son of the king, you're an heir to a throne, you're rescued, you're forgiven, you're set free. That's what he said about you. And so for me to be humble does not mean I think I'm worthless. That's not humility. That's, in fact, false humility. I can have a humble assurance that who I am in Jesus, and that's what he calls me to be. He does not call me to think that I am worthless and a screw-up and all of the things that come along with all those lies that we believe. So this humility, first and foremost, is to have a humble opinion of yourself. But to couple that... With verse 1 of live worthy, 
It literally means I'm bearing the name of Jesus because I have a humble opinion of myself and these two things go together completely. The second part of this, bearing with one another, literally means to show tolerance to each other. (laughs) Tolerance. That's a fun word nowadays, isn't it? Tolerance to the people who do not agree with me politically. Tolerance with the people who do not agree with me about race issues in this country. Tolerance with the people who don't think anything is broken and blah, 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 blah. Tolerance with the people that you live with in your home that you disagree with passionately. Tolerance with the people and the spouses that know how to push the buttons exactly perfectly to drive you up a wall. Tolerance with them too. Tolerance with your children that you curse the day they were born. Tolerance with them too. (laughs) I've never done that, but some of you have, okay? (laughs) Tolerance means tolerance in all of the areas of our life. We don't get to pick and choose. But what sets the tone for Christ-like humility in our world, I go back to the question, is the church to blame for distraction and division in our country? Well, we're not very tolerant people most of the time, and those that are never make it to the front page of anything, only the ones who aren't. And so the world sees the church as this swirling ball of hatred And what I would love to see shifted about the perception of the church in this country is exactly what Paul said. Don't give them any reason to talk negatively about you because when they do, other people will come to your defense and shut them down. So imagine if we're all living our lives like this and we've stepped into what we're made for more to do. And then we start to make it on the front page of these people are so divisive and they're hateful and they have no tolerance for me. And a bunch of non-Christian people come to the defense of Christians and go, no, they're not. You can say a lot of things about them, but they are not that. This is what Paul said. This is what we should be striving for. But right now, I think they would be right. That Christians overall are a bunch of intolerant, hateful people stirring division and strife in this country when we are called to step in and bring unity and peace. And church, this is what you, as a follower of Jesus, are called to do. Even right now in 2020, when it's even scary to do it. So, this statement of making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace, making every effort literally means to exert yourself, to exhaust yourself. So here's, let's paint a picture. Let's say that all the craziness is raging out there and I'm a Christian and I'm gonna stand on the sideline back here. That is not what this is saying. This is saying that I walk forward, I step right into the middle of all of it, and I literally exhaust myself to try to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. So this means everything about me is I am a peacemaker. I'm a hope dealer. I'm the one stepping into the middle, bringing peace to situations for unity through the bond of peace. So imagine, for those of you that like working out or or anything physical like that, you walk into the gym. You should be in dry clothes, not sweating. You should leave the gym drenched in sweat with no energy left to do anything because that's why go to a gym if that's not what you're going to do, right? And so you walk out and you've exhausted yourself completely. This is the same picture. So when I ask this question, I don't want you to take offense, but I do want you to take offense. Is the church to blame for the distraction and division in our country? I don't see any Christians, honestly, including myself, exhausting themselves to bring peace and unity to our city. And I don't know that we would ever be accused of that as Christians right now. So is the church singularly to blame for this? No. But I think it has everything to do, number one, of allowing a country to get to the place that it's at because of all the distractions that we have allowed to consume our life. But then the division, we're not stepping in and doing anything about it. And I'm taking that personally on myself too. I want you to know. But church, I want you to know this is what you're called to do. So that calling Jesus wants you to be, or Paul is urging you to be worthy of, this is what it is. It's much bigger than what you do and where your paycheck comes from. This bond of peace is what literally binds us together. See, hope is what binds all of us together. Some of us have it and some of us don't. That's it. 
That's the only two categories on this planet. Those of you that have it are hope dealers. What binds you together with the other person is they need that hope. And so we are bound together to the lost and the followers of Jesus everywhere on this planet. Now, what I want you to understand about this is there's this nasty little thing that is going to constantly fight against you. It's a five-letter word, starts with P, ends with E. Anybody have an idea of what it's called? Nice. This is a beautiful and lovely thing we're about to talk about, and you're going to love me for this after this. Y'all ready? Really? Not ready? Okay, good. Okay, here we go. So this is a sermon that was written over 300 years ago by Jonathan Edwards, and it's called The Seven Subtle Symptoms of Pride. Because the big, nasty ones are really easy to spot, but these subtle ones are really difficult. So He says, pride will kill you forever. Pride is a sin most likely to keep you from crying out for a savior. As seriously dangerous as pride is, it's equally hard to spot. When it comes to diagnosing our hearts, those of us who have the disease of pride have a challenging time identifying our sickness. Pride infects our eyesight, causing us to view ourselves through a lens that colors and distorts reality. It will even paint our ugliness and sin as beautiful and commendable. Here's what he says these seven things are. The first one is fault finding. When pride causes us to filter out the evil we see in ourselves, it also causes us to filter out God's goodness in others. We sift them, letting only their faults fall into our perception of them. So this is when you would view other people that you disagree with, and the only thing you see about them is their faults, never anything good. He says fault finding is a subtle symptom of pride. Number two, a harsh spirit. Those who have the symptoms of pride in their hearts speak of other sins with contempt, irritation, frustration, or judgment. Pride is crouching inside of of us belittling our struggles. It's cowering in our jokes about the quote-unquote craziness of our spouse. And it may even be lurking in the prayers we throw upward for our friends that are tainted with irritation. They even had crazy wives in the 1700s. Isn't that funny? (laughs) You guys should loosen up. This is a really serious topic. I want you to laugh a little, okay? I'm crazy too. I love my wife. Number three, superficiality. When pride lives in our hearts, listen to this. We are far more concerned with others' perceptions of us than the reality of our hearts. We fight the sins that have an impact on how others view us and make peace with the ones that nobody sees. This is really big. Some of us have become so masterful at not letting anybody see any outright blatant sins to where if anybody looked at us, the Bible says that we're supposed to live blameless in front of people where somebody could look at us and go, honestly, I can't really blame any sin on them. Yeah, I would say they're blameless. But we've made peace with these internal sins. It's because there's superficiality in front of us and God. Then defensiveness. Those who stand in the strength of Christ's righteousness alone Find a confident hiding place from the attacks of men and Satan alike. Those who don't will always defend their position. If you're going to step into unity through a bond of peace in humility, you will constantly be attacked, not only by the enemy, but by the people that you never thought would ever turn their backs on you. If you are defensive because of a subtle symptom of pride, You will defend and defend and defend. If you're walking in humility, you'll have a confident hiding place in Jesus. Number five is presumption before God. Humility approaches God with humble assurance. Key that those two words are together in Christ Jesus. If either the humble or the assurance are missing in that equation, our hearts very well might be infected with the symptoms of pride. Some of us have no shortage of boldness before God, but if we're not careful, we can forget that he is God. And then these last two, I think, are so applicable to us today. Number six is we're desperate for attention. Pride is hungry for attention, respect, and worship in all of its forms. Maybe it sounds like shameless boasting about ourselves. Maybe it's being unable to say no to anyone because we want to be needed. Maybe it looks like obsessively thirsting for marriage or fantasizing about a better marriage because you're hungry to be adored. Maybe it looks like being haunted by your desire for the right car, the right house, or the right title at work. 
all because you seek the glory that comes from men and not from God. And then this last one is neglecting others. Pride prefers some people over others. It honors those whom the world deems worthy of honor, giving more weight to their words, their wants, and their needs. There's a thrill that goes through us when people with power acknowledge us. See, the the outburst of anger, punching a wall, road raging, all of those things are very visible outbursts of anger and pride. We can spot those a mile away. But these subtle ones, they're a little harder. They're a lot harder to recognize. I can tell you from my own experience, this is the number one thing that if I do not pay attention to literally on a continual daily basis, multiple times a day, over and over and over again, it will consume me, period. Literally, this happened to me this week. This is part of a bigger story um, that... I I will share with you as well. But this week, man, I I got so blinded by my own pride that it literally was was honestly one of the the worst weeks I've had in a really, really long time. Up until Thursday when God was gracious to me and communicating with my wife and we we came together and and pride had got at both of us and there was some restitution made and, and a coming together and it literally, both of us had just let pride creep into our relationship. But after I had been saved for about five years, I knew God called us to plant a church. And so we planted a church and, uh, called Revolution, and God was blessing it. It was incredible. And about five years into that church plant, um, there was nothing visibly wrong with it. Uh, people were getting saved. We, were, we had outgrown another building, and um, it was just incredible stories being written about what God was doing. I was the most miserable I'd ever been in my life. I shouldn't have been because per the world and church success, I I was in a really good spot. But I started to ask God, like, would you show me what this is? Because I don't know what this is, but I hate this. I don't even want to do this any longer. And I got to the point where I I just wanted to walk away from the church. Well, one Sunday through some just kind of catastrophic events that happened in the church, I went home that night and I said, God, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And I can tell you, it was legitimately like he came and sat in my living room with me. And he said, Mike, all these people who are getting saved, all these people that are turning their lives around and they're getting discipled, you've taken credit for all of that. And I don't share my glory with anybody. He said, your pride has gotten to a place where you've elevated yourself where I'm at. And I'm not okay with that. And it just broke me. And what it did was it showed me this picture over the last five years of how I had let the subtlety of pride just creep into my life. And what it does is it, it shifts your thinking to where you start to justify the things that you're doing and they become normal to you. And then it rises and it encapsulates you completely where this is the way that you think and nobody can tell you otherwise. And that's exactly where I was at. And as I talked with our elders and our leaders and they didn't really know what it was either. But as I started to tell them, they saw it and it was obvious. And so I stood up the next week and shut that church down. I said, I can't lead you. I can't pastor you. I can't, I can't be in this position right now. Salvation to anyone is the the most gracious thing that God can do because we don't deserve it. But for me, that was the second most gracious thing God has ever done. Because I want you to think about this church. He didn't owe that to me. It never says that he's going to interrupt our paths. It never says that he's going to stop us from doing what we're doing. He allows us to live our lives on this earth. And in Romans calls this active and passive wrath. And in the the path of, act, of passive wrath, he could have allowed me to continue the rest of my life being a pastor in his church, seeing people get saved and growing, and I would, have, I would have been miserable, but I could have kept going. But I think he had enough mercy on me. I have no idea why that he stopped me and he said, this is not what you're going to do with your life. I'm stopping you right now. And it absolutely broke me. Now, from that day forward, there's people in my life that check on me in this and they are around me and they can speak into my life. And even with that present this week, I allowed pride back in. And the reason why I'm telling you this church is because 
Every person on the planet is always going to struggle with pride until we see Jesus face to face. Some of us at higher levels than others. Some of you can see it really easy and some of you can't. But what I can tell you is it's those subtle things that lie underneath the surface that are going to destroy you. And if you find yourself in this spot, listen to me, God already knows. You don't need to hide this from him. You need to confess it to him. He promises to forgive you. This is nothing that you need to to hold on to and walk away from him and be embarrassed and ashamed about. But for some of you, I know right now you're extremely agitated at what I'm saying. And there's something happening inside of you that honestly you do not like me right now, the words that I'm saying or this story. And that's okay. Because what I want you to understand is if you're a follower of Jesus, this is the Holy Spirit that is grinding at you right now saying, listen, he's talking to you. And you need to confess this. And you need to walk away from your pride. And you need to pursue humility. I know what this feels like. I literally seem to go through this all the time. So you can't leave this place without doing something about this church. And for those of you that are not followers of Jesus in this place, what I want you to know is there is rescue and there is hope because I know even talking about this to you and with you not having Jesus in your heart, there's something that is is stirring in you right now. I know that there is. Because for one thing, I know that the Holy Spirit draws us to him and that our pride comes to the forefront as the closer we get to Jesus. So I know you're dealing with something too. And the way that we end our service is we have a bunch of different options for you. If you want to go to that couch, we have people ready to pray for you. Flag us down, we'll come to your seat. Come up here and grab whoever's on the seat. It doesn't matter. Like, we just want to pray with you, deal with you, help you walk through this and see what this is. But church, I promise you, if you can imagine this picture of where this pride is up around you like this, and it's crept all the way up and it's here, and you recognize this right now. You're hearing the words that I'm saying, and you're like, that is me. And you leave here. I am telling you, it's going to close around you, and you're going to leave, and your heart is going to get harder. And the next time you hear something about pride, you're not even going to pay attention to it because you will be fully engrossed in this. And I am begging you not to do that. I know this is uncomfortable, and I know it's difficult, but it's the one thing that will cause God to stand in opposition against you. And if you're a follower of Jesus in this room, I know that's not what you want. So, with that being said, what will you do with this? Those of you that aren't following Jesus, please hear the hope of this message. If you've been burned by Christianity or a Christian, please don't hold that against us. Please just let us share the hope of Jesus with you. My brothers and sisters out here, Take it from me. You do not want to have to walk the path I have walked and be broken to a place where you're, you're forced to change. Just do it now. Confess this and walk away from it. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. God, I pray right now for all of our hearts in this room. This is a pivotal week right now because the enemy does not want us to walk in humility. He loves pride. Pride is what got him kicked out of heaven, and this is what he bases his life and everything that he does around. And these subtle things that lie beneath the surface for us, they're the ones that we never see, the ones we never pay attention to, but they're the ones that are constantly driving what is happening. God, I pray right now against the enemy of distraction, against the enemy that would try to pull our minds somewhere else right now. Pray that you protect this room, protect these people, because it's so crucial that we deal with this right now. So God, I pray for the response right now. People would be doing business with you, confessing their sin and repenting. We love you and we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. If you need prayer or want to talk about salvation, meet us over on the couches.